So this week, we're still in the series we're calling our Clarity Series. In this series, remember what we're doing is we're taking terms and phrases that we often use in the Christian world and bringing clarity to these words and phrases, making sure that we understand what it is that we're talking about. I want to um, speak this morning on a word that we actually talked about several weeks ago. We talked about this word, but we used it in its noun form. In uh, this week's message, I want to use it in its verb form, and the word is disciple. So a couple of weeks ago, we brought clarity to the noun form of disciple, what it means, what it looks like to be a disciple. But this morning, I want to talk about it in its verb form, what it means to disciple. So grab your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The book of 1 Timothy was a, is a book that was written by the Apostle Paul. He was writing to his young protege, Timothy, who Timothy was a pastor. And so Paul is uh, reaching out to him via a letter. Um, the, the book of Timothy is an epistle, and an epistle is not the wife of an apostle. An epistle is a letter, right? And so um, if, if this were today, Paul would have sent him an email. But instead, he sent them this letter, this epistle, right? And here's some of the instructions that he gives young Timothy. We're looking in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. This morning we're talking about the word disciple or what it means to make disciples. And so we see here that, that Paul is making a disciple of Timothy. They were very much engaged in a mentor-protege relationship. And he's, he's uh, giving instructions to Timothy on how to carry out his ministry. And part of his instructions is this, it's to disciple it's to disciple others. And I would say to you that I, I, I feel like one of the greatest needs in the body of Christ today is discipleship. Discipleship is so necessary in the body of Christ. Now, why would you say that, Jody? It's because I, it, you know, in, in my, my life and in my ministry, I find um, that, I, that I'm often in a, in a position where I'm, I'm coaching people, I'm counseling people. And, and if you've come to me recently for counseling, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. I want to air out your problems to the, to the body of Christ. That's not what I'm doing. But I am constantly amazed at how many people who have been in the body of Christ for decades. Listen to me, church. I'm talking about people who have been to church for decades who don't know the Lord. I'm not saying they're not born again, but I'm just saying who really don't know the Lord. And we don't know our basic Christian disciplines. And I really think this is an epidemic in the church of America. And I believe there's a great need for discipleship. And so I, this morning, I'd love for this to feel kind of like a family meeting. So if you're part of the family here at Victory, and especially if you're a mature member, if you've been in this thing for a minute, and if you, if you have some scars, if you have some, some victories you've won, and maybe some losses, but you've learned from them, if you've been in this process, I want to call out to you today as part of our family, saying the body of Christ needs you. The body of Christ needs you. We need mature believers to step up and partner with less mature believers and really begin the process of discipleship. What we see here in this passage that I just read, there's, there's four things that I took note of as I was reading this, this passage. And to me, these four things kind of really give a picture of, of the ingredients of what real discipleship looks like. Look with me again at this verse. Here's the first thing that we find out is there was a relationship between Paul and Timothy because he begins with, Timothy, my dear son, 
So there's a father-son relationship here. It's not pastor-church member. It's father-son. So to me, the first ingredient, if we're really going to bring clarity to the idea of what it looks like to disciple someone else, there has to be a relationship there. The next thing we see is, is what I call modeling because Paul tells Timothy, he said, listen, the things you've seen me do. In other words, Paul saying, Timothy, because you and I have a relationship, you have seen me. You've seen me walk. You've heard the things that I've said. So Paul is modeling things for his protege. Next thing we see is that, that he gives instructions to Timothy to imitate him. So we see imitation. So we see that there was a relationship. We see that there was modeling going on. Next thing is the call for imitation. Paul says to Timothy, the things you've seen me do, I need you to give that to someone else. And then lastly, what we see is the principle of multiplication. Because Paul tells Timothy, he says, hey, take the things that you've heard me say, the things that I've modeled before you, would you pass that along to someone else? And not only pass it along to someone else, pass it along to people who will then pass it along to others. And what we see through this process is Paul and Timothy, it looks like one plus one equals two, but when you, when you add in the, the principle of multiplication, what you see is Paul plus Timothy equals dozens. Because dozens of people were affected by the ministry of, of Paul because Paul discipled Timothy and he's giving Timothy instructions to disciple others. This is a need in the church today. It's a need in the church today. But one thing we've learned as a church is that, that uh, well, first of all, I want to say this about victory is that we know that our assignment from God, if you want to be part of victory or want to know what we're about, what we're about is discipleship. We feel like our assignment is to make disciples. And you've heard me say this, and, and you, you may be bewildered by this statement, but here, here it is again. Sunday morning is a terrible format to make disciples. It just doesn't work. Disciples aren't made on Sunday morning. There's, there's some limitations to our Sunday morning services, okay? I wanna draw your attention to a few of these Sunday morning service limitations. The first thing is, if you'll look at your neighbor closely, you'll realize that they are wearing a mask. Because we all got up this morning and put our Sunday morning service mask on. Didn't we? I don't know about you, but I even, I even gargled with some Listerine before I walked in here this morning. I've got Altoids in my pocket because I got the mask on. And I don't really want you to smell my breath. But all of us get up on a Sunday morning and we put our masks on. And it is possible to sit next to someone Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and never really know them. And so these gatherings are great. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't trade our Sunday morning gatherings, but I'll just tell you this, our Sunday morning gathering, this is the front door. This is just the foyer, the foyer right? But real discipleship doesn't happen in this setting. Because real discipleship has to have a relationship attached to it. So there's, we're, we're limited in our Sunday morning services because we all show up with our masks on. Another thing that really limits our Sunday morning services, and I, I want to be careful with this because I believe in the power of the gospel, but in my experience, a message really doesn't change someone's life. I mean, hopefully what I share to you today will be earth-shattering. It'll blow your hair back. But often we go away going, wasn't that earth shattering and didn't my hair get blown back? And it affects our life 0%. And we can listen to sermon after sermon after sermon and we're no more a disciple when we leave than when we walked in. Because discipleship doesn't happen in big groups like this, in big settings, and it doesn't happen. Listen, Jesus, never, Jesus preached to the multitudes, but he discipled 12. He would leave the multitude and his disciples would go, hey, 
What the heck were you talking about? And he's like, okay, come over here. Let me, let me unpack this for you. And he would personally walk them through it, right? So we are limited in our ability to disciple in our Sunday morning services. Plus, I mean, we try to keep our services here about 75 minutes. And so there is no way to make a disciple in 75 minutes one time a week. It just doesn't happen. And let me just say this, add this to it. In our children's ministry and in our youth ministry, Pastor Felix and, and the Kidmo team cannot make a disciple of your kid for, in 45 minutes once a week. It just doesn't happen that way. They are not going to receive the foundation that they need to really walk with God the rest of you know, their entire life by just coming and visiting church on a Sunday morning. Have I made my point that this is not, this is not the format in which to truly make disciples? It needs to look different. And if victory is going to really accomplish its assignment, we've got to figure out what it means. How do we, how do we really bring people to a place where we can begin to disciple them? And I would submit to you that first of all, if real discipleship is going to have to happen, there's going to have to be a relationship. We're going to have to connect with one another and get past the masks. And that we're going to have to create settings where we can get together in, in smaller groups. In fact, I would say to you to bring ultimate clarity, to bring ultimate clarity to the term discipleship and its verb and its verb tense, I would say this, that true discipleship what it looks like to really disciple someone else. First of all, it, it, it's about taking one person or a very small group of people and gathering them in an intimate setting for the specific purpose of growing them individually as a Christ follower. That's what discipleship looks like. That to me is ultimate, the ultimate clarity of the word discipleship. And I'm just determined that here at Victory, we're going to figure it out. Let me say that over here. I'm just determined that we're going to figure that, this out, right? And we are not just going to be a gathering of casual Christians who show up on a Sunday morning to go through a religious routine, but that God will help us through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We will be able to take people and walk them and move them along in their walk with God. And we will have some Bible-believing, God-knowing, God-fearing, God-worshipping, God-living Christians as a church. Amen. Amen. So this, this is our desire. So the, the joke around here is if, if you do partner with us, get used to feeling my hands in the middle of your back because I'm just going to be pushing, right? Like discipleship, discipleship, discipleship. But it's going to take getting together. And again, I'm, I'm really speaking to, to maybe some mature believers in the house who you've been walking with God for a while and you've got the goods and you, you know the word and you know the Lord, but maybe you're comfortable or maybe you substitute your, your, your service on Sunday morning for true discipleship. You signed up to be a greeter and you say, well, that, that's my service to the kingdom of God. Well, thank you. We need greeters and we appreciate all the people who would give of their time and energy to serve our body here. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. But that is not the ultimate call of God. The Great Commission is not go and be a greeter on a Sunday morning. The Great Commission is go and make a disciple. Make a disciple. But we've got to really get to know people and get in those intimate settings because, you know, it's, it's in knowing one another and in these intimate settings that we really begin to, to learn what, who people really are, right? We see in, 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 in the book of Matthew, the 12th chapter, we see Jesus bring out this principle. Matthew chapter 12, we see that, that Jesus introduces a principle that's, that's true and it's, been, it's always going to be true. But in this specific setting, he's, he's actually rebuking the Pharisees. So, so this is kind of a hard, you know, we jump in on a hard conversation he's having. But in this conversation, he introduces an important principle. Matthew 12 verse 34 says this, Jesus speaking, he said, you brood of snakes. What a great introduction. Speaking to the Pharisees, he said, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? 
For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. If you're reading in the King James, you know that it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It says a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasure of an evil, part, um, evil heart. Jody, what's your point? Here, here's my point. As we get in these smaller set, you see, it's easy on the Sunday morning to have all your stuff together. I mean, you just look good, you smell good. I mean, you're just shined up and ready to be here. Congratulations. But that's the mask, right? But what I've learned is if you hang around with someone long enough, what's in their heart is gonna come out of their mouth, right? And you'll really begin to know who people are. Now, I was, I've been cautious about using the example I'm gonna use because um, Every year I get invited on some really good hunting trips and if you know Jody, Jody loves a good hunting trip and I'm about to throw all my hunting partners under the bus. And I may not get invited to the hunt this year, so I may need some new hunts. So I'm fishing right now for a new hunting invitation. But here's what I've learned. You go to the hunting camp with a couple guys And the first day, we still got the mask securely in place. Oh, praise the Lord, brother. What a glorious day to be out in God's creation. On day two, what the? And you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? And what happens is you hang around people in that, in that relaxed, intimate setting in, in real personal connections, and you'll hear what's in their heart because Jesus told us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your mouth will always, will always confirm what's going on in your heart. Now, what am I saying to you? Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, church, get better at hiding what's in your heart. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not here to shame anybody who what has come out of their heart wasn't perfectly pure and holy. That's for my hunting buddies. I know I heard you say that, but I still love you, and I still love hunting. So that's that's not what I'm doing. So I'm not doing this to shame one another. What I'm saying is me as someone who really wants to disciple others, when I hear my brother, even if he's been in church his entire life, when his heart, when his mouth shows me what's really in his heart, and I go, wow, I didn't know that was in there. Me as a discipler, I already, now I know how to minister to my brother. Now I know how to speak into that area. Maybe encourage him, speak some word over this. Are y'all tracking with me? So when we get in these intimate settings, we're really going to see one another. Another thing that's going to happen is when you, when you get in these intimate settings and you start building relationships, another principle I love is, is this, that, that pressure always reveals cracks. I I use this all the time in my counseling. When you walk out of this building today, if you walk out and find that you have a flat tire, you walk out and your tire is sitting on the rim, how do you figure out what the problem is? You put air in it because pressure reveals cracks. You put enough pressure in it and where the pressure is being released will become indicated. So what what do I mean by this? I mean, as we get in each other's lives, the pressure that life puts us on, it's it's gonna reveal the holes in our lives. And I'm not saying to you, get better at hiding the holes because we're not into hiding holes. But as someone who wants to disciple, when I'm, when I'm with a brother and, and I see the pressure that life is putting on him and, and the cracks are revealed, now I know how to pray for that brother and how to instruct that brother and how to disciple that brother. So the idea is as we get in each other's lives and as we build these relationships and as, as, as we have these intimate settings, we're going to see things about one another. What you value comes out when you get close to people. I mean, if you, if you just love golfing, we spend a few days together, golfing's going to come out. You're going to come out with a Titleist shirt on. It's going to come out in what you say. You see what I'm saying? So as we get close to one another, but on these Sunday morning services, I don't know that about you. Because we can sit there shoulder to shoulder with our masks on and never become true disciples. 
I'm telling you, I believe one of the greatest needs in the body of Christ is discipleship. Here's what we don't need. You know what? Here's what we don't need in the body of Christ. We don't need another celebrity preacher. We, we don't need another celebrity preacher. And I'm not throwing rocks at any of them because there are, there are people that I watch online and stuff and they bless me in their ministry. But are they discipling me? Absolutely. They don't know Jody LaFleur. They don't know what I deal with. They don't know my life. And so they're a great source of encouragement for me, but they're not discipling me. And, and even the mega churches, I mean, we look at, at mega churches and we say, you know, I just don't think we need any more of those. Not that there's anything wrong with them. They're doing great things. But, but I, you know, personally as a staff, we, we're, victory is growing and we appreciate that. But sometimes when we talk about growth, we say, listen, I couldn't care less if we had 2,000 people at this church if we're not making disciples. If we're just making spectators because we've got a better show than the church down the road, I'm not interested. Yeah. I'm not interested. I'm interested in making disciples. And as a church, we're, we're having to figure out how to do that. Because I guarantee you, every church in America is doing what we're doing. They're trying to figure out how to make disciples. We're trying to figure out how to really make disciples. You know, some of our efforts have been small groups. You know, the last 35, 40 years in the body of Christ, small groups have been a big thing. Let me ask you a couple of questions about small groups, okay? And please answer these questions by raising your hands. How many of you have been in a small group at some point in your Christian walk? Look around, a lot of us. Okay, put your hands down. I want to ask you two more questions, okay? Go along with it. Please answer me. How many of you could say that my small group experience was a good one and I've grown from my small group? Beautiful. You see that? All right. The number's less, though. Here's the last question. How many of you have led a small group? Beautiful. I love it. Golly, that's a good number of people here in the church. Thank you for leading small groups. So we know, listen, small group ministry in the body of Christ is just about doing what, I, what I've been preaching about. It's just about discipleship. It's just about getting in smaller groups where we can really get to know one another. We can hear what's, what's in our heart because out of the abundance of the mouth, heart the mouth speaks. We can see how they respond when pressure comes, right? So those small groups have been a great tool, but inherently they, they come with some challenges. If you ask any church in the United States about small group ministry, like what is the, the greatest challenge? The number one challenge that they all face is finding leaders. Because, you know, I've had people tell me, oh my gosh, my small group is the greatest thing in the world. I couldn't live without my small group. You're like, really? Oh my goodness. We, we want to make a commercial out of you then, you know. Small group ministry can't be. And then say, okay, well, I tell you what, since it's been so productive, would you lead one for us? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, you see, I don't, and I can't, and I won't, and I, you know, I mean, the, now you're seeing my frustration as a pastor coming out. I'm going to rant about this for a few seconds. Because, oh, no, I can't do that. I wanna, and so finding leaders is a challenge in small group ministry. Next thing is, is training leaders. Because, you know, discipleship really is about duplicating yourself. And I just don't mind saying that there's a few of you who I really don't want you to duplicate yourself. We've got all we can handle with just you. We don't need any more like you. No, but the point is, you know, if you do get somebody to sign up to be a small group leader, next thing you know, we got to train you and vet you, make sure you're not a cult leader, you know I mean? You understand? And then location and child care and who's bringing the casserole. Those are all challenges that come with small group ministry. Now, I'm not saying we're giving up on small group ministry because small group ministry has been one of the greatest tools we've had for discipleship. However, I'm, I just believe that God wants to bring us past even small group ministry. I believe that the greatest, the greatest tool for making disciples isn't a program, it's people. It's the people of God who will step up and say, I will invest my life in someone else. I will expend the time and energy 
and effort it takes to invest my life in someone else. And this week in our staff, in our staff meeting, I'm, I need somebody to go lock the doors of my office so you can't see it. But in, in our staff meeting this week, I actually got up in our conference room and made a list of people who ought to be discipling others. And some of you, your name is on that list because you need to be discipling others. I look at you and say, that man and woman, they know the word of God. They're not perfect. They're not sinless. They don't have it all together, but they know the word and they know God and they've won some victories. They've got some scars. They've been through some issues. Now, why aren't, aren't those people pouring into someone else? What we don't need is another program. We just need people. We need the people of God who are infected with the great commission and are so excited about what God has done in them that they would want to help someone else. So my, my point here this morning, this really is a family meeting. I wanna bring clarity to the idea of what it means to truly disciple someone. But above that, I'm calling to our family. I'm calling to the family of God saying, would you please step up? There is someone in this room who needs you. And they may be tattered and torn and, 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 and in shambles and, and, and it may be obvious that they need help or they may be dressed better than you. And they may drive a better car than you and live in a better house than you, but they need the Jesus in you given to them, amen? So I'm calling out to the body of Christ, saying, church, we don't need another program. We need people. So this morning, what I wanna accomplish in this message, I always like to end with some sort of action step or what is this about? The number one thing I, I, I hope that the Lord would do through this message is motivate you motivate you to share your life with someone else. You know, I'm tired of seeing people in the ministry retire from ministry and quit ministry. I see ministers who have retired and when they, when they left the office, they left ministry. Listen, if you're truly called to ministry, you don't need a title or a paycheck or an office or anything like that, right? If you're called to ministry, ministry ought to be pouring out of you 24 seven. So I'm calling to you retired ministers, quit being retired, get up and get to work. We need you in the body of Christ. I guarantee you there's someone in this room who needs you. Engage, engage, engage. So I've offended my hunting buddies. I think I just offended my parents, yeah. They're not retired. I mean, they're retired, but they're still engaged, right? So there's just a list. I'm just making y'all mad this morning. So the first thing I want to accomplish this morning is to motivate us to, to get, um, to, to engage in this process. But the second thing I want to accomplish is I believe that the Lord needs to give us a new paradigm for what it looks like to make disciples, because I think some of us, you know, we've been a part of the small group ministry, but we were burned by it. Because I've talked to small group leaders who said, man, we love our small group. But it quickly turned into not a small group. I've talked to leaders who said, we have 40 people at our house. That's not a small group. That's a church. There are people who would, <laughs> pastors who would love to have 40 people. And you're tired of it because they're flushing your toilet 800 times a week. And I understand that it's taxing on you. And what's funny was these leaders with 40 people in their small group, they would go to their small group and go, do you like our small group? And they were like, oh, their members were like, this is the greatest thing ever. Right? And so they're fired up about this small group. And then the leader would turn around to that person and go, since it's so effective in your life, can we maybe take this group and you take half of it and I'll take half of it? And that person's like, no, 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 no. I don't have a big enough house or I don't have enough toilet paper or I don't have enough whatever. And so we found all the reasons. So church, my point is this, we need a new paradigm. I'm not saying that small group ministry is obsolete and we ought to not be doing it. I'm just saying this, that I really believe 
that the Lord needs to give his people a paradigm where organically we will begin to just invite somebody to lunch and let them start to unpack their heart and you hear the issues and you begin to pray with them and maybe you open the word and show them the scripture that you stood on when you were in their position. And you show them how to love their wife and you show them how to, how to respect your husband and raise your children and deal with adversity and, and believe God through financially tough times and the, the things that you've learned if you would just begin to share it with someone else because God needs to do that in his body. We need a new paradigm for what it means to make disciples. So I can just tell you, church, I'm not sure what you feel about this message or what you receive from this, but I would hope that you would be encouraged, motivated to begin to pour your life into someone else. And then as we close here today, what I wanna do is I wanna pray that God would give us a new paradigm so that organically we could begin to address this issue. Can I tell you, church, I'm really concerned about those of you believers who've been in church for a long time and you are now what I call institutionalized. You hear this message and you go, yeah, I do want to help somebody else. So I'm going to start a class on whatever. Let me tell you, we don't need any more classes. People are too busy for classes. But you know what people do is they drink coffee. So bring them down to the village, buy them a cup of coffee and get hot begin pouring into people's lives. You know what, church? You know what? We, we don't need, the body of Christ doesn't need to address any more social justice issues. The, the world doesn't need us involved in social justice. The world needs us involved in discipleship. You understand what I'm saying? Not that we can't be involved at all in social issues. I'm just saying sometimes the church, we distract ourselves with all these other movements and we're not doing the basic thing that we've been called to do and it's make disciples. If you agree with me and think that that was the best message you've ever heard, would you stand up? I knew it. See, look at all of you. Affirmation for me. Here's how I want to finish. I really want to pray. And, and again, I, I'm so concerned that we just got to, hey, yeah, it's Sunday morning and Jody finished and we always close in prayer. I don't want that mentality in us. What I'm, pray, what I'm asking is that the Holy Spirit would so rock us that we would begin to pour our life into someone else. So if you are ready, if you are ready to be a vessel and be used by God, even if you don't feel qualified yet, but if this message has touched you, would you just bow your head in some kind of posture of prayer and, and in the presence of God? And I wanna pray over us as a body. Lord, you have given us the assignment to make disciples, but Lord, we need the heart to do it. We need the plan to do it. And so me as the pastor, as the spiritual authority over this house, I'm asking for the motivation. I'm asking for the plan that you would cause us to be effective and fruitful in making disciples, Lord. That's my prayer. Now, Lord, I pray that you would hear the prayer of every person opening up their life to you. Lord, use these men and women and soccer moms and, 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 and plant worker dads. Lord, use us. Use us to make disciples, to be effective for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, and everybody said,